My guest today is David Bernstein, the founder of Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, Bernstein's new book, Woke Antisemitism, How a Progressive Ideology Harms Jews, is now available in online bookstores. Nathan Sharansky, former refusenik and Israeli government minister, writes in the foreword of the book, and I, I'm quoting, David Bernstein has written an important book on how an ideology that has taken hold in America functions to spread anti-Semitism. He argues that the very fixed concept of privilege, white privilege, male, male privilege, etc., which defines precisely who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed by virtue of their identity, will inev inevitably lead to the Jewish community and Israel being labeled the oppressor. Indeed, any ideology that connects identity to power will ultimately be used to assert Jewish power over the lives of the oppressed. It's already happening. End of quote. And to explain to us how it is happening, we have the author himself, David Bernstein. Hello. Hi. Good to be Hi. with you. Congratulations with your new book. Thank you. It's great to have it out. Yeah. Uh, how, how long was the pregnancy? It was a short pregnancy, very short pregnancy. Um, you know, I had been writing about this topic for months and a year in various opinion pieces and the like. So a friend of mine said, it's time for you to write your book. And I said, okay, I'm going to write it. And I wrote it very, uh, in, you know, a few months and uh, got it out a couple of months later. We actually rushed it to the market because we thought it was such a timely topic and we didn't want to you know, wait for the paper shortage to catch up. So right now it's just that you can, you can order it on demand, you can get it on your Kindle, um, but it's not being widely distributed in bookstores yet because that takes so long to do right now. Yeah, yeah. This is the reality of 2022. <laughs> 2022 reality, exactly. Um... So, but why did you write this book? You know, one of the problems that I've seen, um, first of all, within the Jewish community, is that many Jewish organizations, many communal institutions, have embraced this ideology I call woke ideology. And if you'd like, I can take one second to define yep. that for you. Yeah, please. Um, woke ideology holds two basic pillars. One that um, bias and oppression are embedded in the very systems and structures of society. It's not just a matter of personal attitude. And two, that only those with lived experience, only those who have suffered from that oppression, have the insight and really the moral standing to define it for the rest of society. And it's that second claim, that standpoint claim, that only those with lived experience of oppression can define it, that can be used to shut down debate. It can be used mm. to impose dogma on society. And sometimes it has been used in that way. That's what we mean by cancel culture. Yep. Um, so that was gaining ground for the last you know, 25 years. And I really traced that back. Um, we're living in an age of ideology. We're living in an age of right-wing ideologies. We're living in an age of left-wing ideologies. And these ideologies can take anti-Semitic forms that are in society and give them a permission structure. So, mm -hmm. for example, on the right, you have replacement theory, which is a very popular idea on the extreme right, which is that, um, immig that immigrants are coming into this country and replacing the average American worker. Um, and Jews are oftentimes blamed for doing the replacing. We are animating the conditions that lead to these people being disenfranchised for their own country. That's an ideology, and it's an ideology that harms Jews on the right. You see, in the Muslim world, um, you know, we don't just say that there's Muslim anti-Semitism. We trace it back to its ideological antecedents, to Islamism, to jihad ideology, to the idea of the infidel. When we talk about anti-Semitism in the left, however, we often talk about a symptom without a cause, as if it just somehow came from outer space and landed on Earth one day. And I think what we're seeing, of course, is that we've long had anti-Semitism on the left. We saw it in the Soviet Union in the form of anti-Zionism, but that also was embedded in a far left-wing totalitarian ideology. It didn't mm. come from nowhere either. Um, this is being empowered by this ideology on the left I call woke ideology or radical social justice ideology. 
And I think it's important that if Jewish organizations and Jews are going to fight it, that they name the ideology correctly, that they connect the dots. And that's what I wanted to do for them is to connect the dots, number one. And number two, they've got to stop doing it themselves. And a lot of American Jews have been sort of sucked into this ideology because it it, because it's it's a Trojan horse, as we say, it it, it pretends to be a, a civil rights ideology. It, it pretends to uh, be about just people's rights, and of course, there are people who are very well-meaning who are embracing this. They're not they're not bad people, um, and they really want society to be a place that is extends equality to all people. But but they've embraced sometimes, in some cases, an ideology that actually worsens things. It's not a good social model, in my view, and it, and it can fan the flames of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Uh, you quote an illustration is your book, in your book saying that the threat to Jews from the right is like a heart attack and the threat from the left is more like a cancer. Maybe you can yes. uh, explain more about that. Yeah, you know, there's another quote. I'll use Jonathan Greenblatt, who's the head of the ADL, who gives a similar quote that the anti-Semitism on the right is like a hurricane on and on the left or like CO is like a climate change. Climate change is slower acting than a hurricane, of course. I think that's true. But then uh, the question I would have for my friend Jonathan Greenblatt would be, what are the CO2 emissions that are causing the climate change? You know, look, anti-Semitism on the right is a is a real and present danger, right? It um, it can be used by people with guns, as they did in the synagogue in Squirrel Hill, Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh, um, to kill people. the 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 man who um, who murdered eleven Jews in Squirrel Hill, uh, Pennsylvania, did it because he thought Jews were helping bring in all kinds of immigrants, uh, illegal mm -hmm. immigrants, into this country, and he had to act now to stop it. Um, yeah. So th th that's a real and present danger. The the um, left wing anti-Semitism we're seeing is corrosive. It corrodes it, it corrodes the Jewish position in society. It disenfranchises Jews from politics. It makes it impossible for Jews to participate in in social justice coalitions. Um, it it brings about over time this idea that Jews are a privileged class within society and are complicit in white supremacy. So it's a it, it acts very different. It corrodes support for Israel and, and makes people less likely to support the Jewish state in the long run. So all those things are, make it more like climate change and on the right more like a hurricane or more like a heart attack and more like cancer. Yeah. So um, when when we in Scandinavia look uh, to to the U.S. and and we as a pro-Israel organization we we are a bit envious because like 70% of the population in the US supports Israel and and my I'm wondering maybe if if wokeness in regards to Israel came earlier like one or two generations earlier to Europe than, than to the US do you agree with that assumption Yeah I don't know if it was exactly wokeness but I think no, what sure. I, but probably post but you know really post colonial ideology is wokeness yep. applied uh, applied globally, right? When uh, uh, wokeness is post-colonial ideology applied domestically. So I think post-colonialism has been in the European bloodstream for quite some time, and that has colored attitudes on on Israel very early on. So when I would, when I was a pro-Israel student activist in college, and I would uh, meet with my European counterparts, they had already been sort of infected with with that view. Um, yeah. So and so, but but what's happening now is wokeness is taking over institutions at a much higher rapid rate than it is even in Anglo, you know, countries in Europe like the UK or New Zealand or Australia. I mean, it's um, Canada as well, by the way. It's it's really taking mm. Canada by storm. Um, yeah. So yes, we start from a different position. I think Americans are much more predisposed in general to support a democracy in the Middle East. There, it has sort of the fighting spirit that is consonant with the American with American identity and American national identity, but it's 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 shifting now. And you can see in the polls, we just we just released a poll last week where we saw the decline in sympathy toward Israel. And the hard edge narrative of Israel as a colonial state is it's gaining the upper hand. You know, it's not overnight. It's still about 30% of Democrats view Israel as a colonial state or state. But again, that's 
that's um, that's still significant. So we're becoming more like you, unfortunately, yeah. in that yeah. way. Um, but yeah. but I and, and and in some ways we may be surpassing you ideologically. Like I think the yeah. actual this idea of oppressed versus oppressor as a fundamental understanding of how the world works. That's probably done more institutional damage in the United States than it ever has anywhere in Europe. Yeah, I think at least here in Norway, it hasn't caught on as as serious as it seems to be in the U.S. Um, so, is there a kind of wokeness that is not anti-Israel, that is not anti-Semitic? Would you say? Yeah, yeah I don't think woke ideology is inherently anti-Semitic yeah. or anti-Zionist. I think it is inevitably anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. And the reason why I make that distinction is that um, is that it 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 doesn't there's nothing in woke ideology that says Jews are oppressors. When you have a fixed concept of oppression with who has privileged and who doesn't, with who's the oppressed and who's the oppressor, you're very likely only a half step away from the idea of Jewish privilege. If you go, if you're fixated on white privilege, then you're a half step away from Jewish privilege. If you're fixated on the oppressor versus the oppressor, it's not that long until you'll see Israel as the oppressor and the Palestinians as the oppressed. Because those ideas are already out there in the lifeblood of society, right? So they're, yeah. they're, 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 you can take them right off the shelf. So my kids, for example, are going to learn from a curriculum, a social studies curriculum that teaches students to recognize and resist systems of oppression. What, what that does is it conditions them to think in a certain way in very binary terms. And over time, that's likely to, to condition many more of them to view Israel as the oppressor and Palestinians as the oppressed, or Jews in America as the oppressor, and everybody who doesn't have power or who is on average below the mean as the oppressed. That's the problem. Yeah. Uh, you write in your book, uh, quote, critical race theory does not merely make it easy to demonize Jews using the language of social justice. It makes it difficult not to. So it's like yeah. what you it's were just saying. It's a quote from Pamela Poreski, I believe, from okay. uh, yeah. her article, Critical Race Theory and the Hyper-White Jew. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, but uh, how is it that it makes it difficult not to... I think you explained it uh, already, uh, but right. uh, yeah. try to unpack it again for, for Norwegians that may not be so much familiar with, with the debate in the US and what critical yeah. race theory is. I'll add a nuance to it. Um, well, hmm. critical race theory is a theory, right? Critical race theory is a legal theory that um, that our laws, our civil rights laws, really did not deal with the inherent and, uh, systemic racism in our society, and that it's there to unpack that and uh, identify it so that we can deal with these embedded issues in society. Um, and that, and and that, but it can easily ripen into a dogma, as my book argues that that it can start as a as a theory and become universally accepted by a segment of people so much so that they're imposing it on everybody else. And they're saying, this is the only explanation for disparity. So that's what critical race theory has become in the popular imagination, uh, rather than just in the way it was originally taught in law schools. Um, what mm -hmm. what um, is happening though, is that some people have taken it to different levels. So for example, a very popular book by Ibram X. Kendi believes that all disparity is a function of discrimination. In other words, if there are groups who are below the mean, they are below the mean because they are discriminated against. And if there are groups that are above the mean, by the same token, they must be doing the discriminating, or that at the very least, they must be complicit in the discrimination. And that's a very danger, that's a danger for Jews and other ethnic communities like, like Asians, for example, that are doing much better on average. They're then viewed as complicit in white supremacy because, because group, some groups are on average not um, below the mean. And I think that's why my colleague Pamela Poreski said it, um, it, it inevitably leads to anti-Semitism. Yeah. Uh, there was a university in, in California with, which was in the headlines uh, even in Europe uh, a few weeks ago when when some students groups would forbid Zionist speakers so 
maybe you can explain to us what really happened there and if it's what is was there any outcome of the of the media attention yeah so um berkeley college of law which is a an elite american university uh, nine different student groups at berkeley college of law said that they were changing their bylaws so that that they would not have any Zionist speakers. Um, an article um, was written by Kenneth Marcus from um, the Brandeis Center for Human Rights that brought this to light and caused a firestorm um, on, on campus and off campus. The dean of the law school, who is Jewish, and said, I'm a progressive Zionist myself and wouldn't be allowed to speak under those guidelines. But he didn't. He 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 didn't really try to challenge it or do anything on the part of the university until that article came out and really changed the dynamic. And it caused so much uproar that eventually he said that he would use the existing authority under the law to if if any of those groups use their bylaws. In other words, he's basically saying, okay, they can have in their bylaws, but if they actually discriminate by preventing a speaker from coming on campus, we're going to take, we're going to prevent that from happening. But, so you can but say just, that. Uh, just yeah. uh, for clarification, so did the students group uh, decide that within their own meetings and events, they would not have Zionist speakers or would they forbid it on the whole campus for all other organizations as well? No, no only their own organizations on campus. Yeah. They can't, they have no power to forbid it for anybody else. All they can do is forbid it from themselves. Yeah. Um, so, but wouldn't, isn't it, wouldn't they, um, I mean, if we are liberal, wouldn't they be, shouldn't they be allowed to, to say that, that we, that we won't have any Zionist speakers? Yeah, so two things about that. It is a bit, there is a bit controversy around, uh, around that. Um, you, you, there are existing civil rights laws that prevent you from discriminating against other groups, including Jews. Jews are mm -hmm. protected category. And so they're not allowed to discriminate against Jews. By discriminating against Zionists, the question is, are they really just saying we don't want Jews? Or are they, is it an ideological litmus test alone that any student group should be able to employ if it wants to? And there are people who have made that latter argument. But I think many of us believe that in this case, Zionism is just a, uh, a substitute, a proxy for the idea of Jews. And what they're really saying is, what they're really doing is disenfranchising Jews by, by adopting that. Because yeah. almost, overwhelmingly, almost all Jews are Zionists. They may not go around you know, wearing a, um, a, an Israeli flag draped around their chest, but that's just part of their identity as Jews. And yeah. so I think that, that that argument has won the day, thankfully, but there are people who made the other argument, even within the uh, progressive Zionist community, who think that you know, it really wasn't um, discriminatory in the, that way. Yeah. So uh, you quote uh, a recent poll uh, from American Jewish Committee in your book, 23% of Jewish millennials reported that the anti-Israel climate on their campuses had forced them to hide their Jewish identity. Maybe, uh, maybe you can speak a bit about uh, uh, some experiences that, that uh, people you know have had within the last decade maybe of of how how it is to to be um, uh, a, a young young Jewish student in an anti-Israel campus. Yeah, so I was actually the head of a pro-Israel organiza campus organization called the David Project from 2010 to 2015. Um, the organization trained high school and college students to be effective advocates for Israel on their campuses. So I spent a lot of time on campus. Um, and it was, an, it was negative then. I mean, for, for sure. Like there were all kinds of incidents that were happening on campus. Some sometimes it was from a professor who who was discriminatory toward anybody who didn't adhere to his party line. And sometimes it came from other students who were doing things like apartheid week on campus or had mock checkpoints. You know, where a student would be walking around and they were asked to go through some checkpoint, which is really harassing. Um, or there were you know, flyers on a door that either said, you know, no Zionist, Zionist free zone or a Jew free zone in some cases. Um, so, you know, it's been there for a long time. What's what's happened in the last few years is that we, as woke ideology has caught on and this oppressive oppressor, bi, press, oppressor binary has set in, 
it's actually made things much worse. So now there's mm -hmm. a new discourse that makes it even more likely that if you're a Jewish student who supports Israel, you're going to be viewed as part of the oppressor class on campus. And you're supposed to then acknowledge your own privilege and, yep. and then work against that, work to undermine your own political standing. So that makes it very hard for students then to be active on campus. Now, many do. I mean, there are many pro-Israel students um, that are active on their uh, campuses no matter what. But obviously, we don't want a quarter of students feeling like they can't be their whole selves when they uh, are on campus. Um, I should also say, by the way, that the vast majority of Jews go to around 400 or so campuses, and there are probably 4,000 or so campuses around the United States. So you're, you're not dealing with everywhere. There are probably campuses all over the country with almost no Jews and almost no politics either. They're just places where people go to get their degrees. But the, yeah. but the campuses that we're talking about are some, the ones that you probably have heard of, of in yeah. Norway, you know, places like Harvard or Yale or Berkeley or mm. you know, Emory or George Washington University. These are the places where Jews attend and these are the places where there are problems as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, then my next quick, next question would be why, why do you think it is like, uh, why do you think that the problem is the worst in the elite universities? You know, those are places that are in general, more ideological, they're more mm. political. Like if you're a, if you're a person going to a community college or a college, um, you know, somewhere out, outside of the major urban centers, you know, you're there to get your degree, Yeah. maybe probably working from, you know, driving from your home, working to get your degree so that you can practice whatever pharmaceutical, you know, uh, technology. Yeah. You know, you're not there to um, debate the big issues of the day. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, I'm not sure they're there anymore, by the way, to debate the big issues today. They think they are. But today in this ideological environment, there's sort of only one side of the debate. Yeah. Um, but but that's how it's historically been. So these places are places where there's where there's the luxury of politics is there for the students. There are students who are already probably largely fluent in um, in in politics. They come, you know, these are advanced students who are likely to you know, come with pol existing political attitudes and yeah. um, and that's where these discussions take place. Yeah. So you are not only uh, an author, but you're also an uh, activist. You're you are in this work for for the long run. You have started the uh, Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and, and um, like what are the solutions to the problems that you that you uh, describe in your book? Right. So the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values has two basic functions. One is to ensure that the Jewish community continues to embrace viewpoint diversity, that we don't shut down the discussion on these critical issues in our own ranks, which I think has happened in many sectors of the community, uh, particularly on the center left progressive side. There's just almost no debate on these societal issues anymore. Um, and, um, and I think that's a problem. Um, and also to warn them how this ideology then can spawn uh, this new variant of anti-Semitism. Um, another thing that we do is build bridges to other ethnic communities and religious communities that are similarly situated, particularly Asian Americans. There are also black heterodox thinkers and, and activists who are very concerned that their children are being taught in this environment, that the system is rigged against them and that mm. that is not good for them. Um, and then you know there are other ethnic communities, Indians and Nigerians and others who just don't want their kids to be called, told that America is an oppressive country. They came here they and to flee from that kind of ideology, not to come to it. So those are people that I think are still just getting organized and we're just getting organized on these issues. Um, and we're building bridges and we wanna create a new mo movement, multi-ethnic movement that opposes uh, the ideology and stands for classical liberal values of free expression and rule of law and the like. Um, mm. So that is that is key. And in that, also educate those people about Jews in Israel and anti-Semitism and, you know, take them to Israel on trips and the like, which we plan to do. So yep. um, so those are the kinds of things that we're, um, 
we're, we're working on. Um, I think in general, the American Jewish community needs to go and reevaluate its position in society and understand that, um, that it shouldn't be linked with either the far left or the far right, that both are real and present dangers in different ways, and that mm. we have to start rebuilding the center of American society. Um, you know, Jews do well in liberal, open societies, and we do not do well in closed societies. And, uh, and I think we have a biting interest in preserving those institutions of democracy in our country, which are under threat in ways that, that I haven't seen in my lifetime. Um, and, um, and that that's where we belong. And mm -hmm. I just don't think that enough people have woken up um, and gotten it. You know, look, there's a good reason to be afraid of the American right, you know, and many Jews are. So even if they might otherwise have been alerted to this danger coming from the left, the, the danger from the right seems so overwhelming and so real um, that they're sort of deterred from really going there. And I want them to go there at the same time that they're expressing that concern about the right. Yeah. So it's like uh, Sharansky wrote in, in the foreword to your book, uh, quote, the role of the Jew is not to join forces with the ideology, ideology, ideology. <laughs> ideological fads of the day, but to stand up for independent thought and the liberal principles on which the democracies of the world were founded. Yeah. So, um, is it, uh, is there anything Israel can do? And, and like, uh, like most of the far majority of the members of my organization in, in Norway and in, Scandin in Scandinavia, they are non-Jewish. Uh, it's like they are Christian of variety of sorts, secular, we have Muslim members, but but we support the, the Jewish people's right to to um, to a state in Israel. And so is there anything uh, that that the government of Israel can do, Israeli organizations or pro-Israel organizations to um, to reduce uh, or to counter the, the threat of wokeness? Yeah, I'm actually writing a paper as we speak, finishing a paper on how wokeness stands as a national security threat for the state of Israel. So I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, I think that um, Israeli sh Israel, as you know, a, a official Israel, has to start to realize that this ideology, what it is, and understand how it affects it. And, you know, they should diversify too. like, you know, don't depend just on the United States and that U.S.-Israel relations will be uh, tomorrow what they are today. Um, I want to forestall that from happening, but I think I have to be realistic. If this ideology continues um, its long march through our institutions, we're going to be in trouble in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So I, that's mm -hmm. being realistic and, and, and diversifying just like you would with any set of threats. It may not yeah. come about that way, but it could come about that way, and you have to be ready for it. Yeah. I think Israelis can play a role, and maybe so can Europeans, in engaging their American counterparts and expressing concern, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and saying, look, we're worried about this ideology. You know, it's, it's very hard for some American Jewish leaders to do that or hear it or to express it in this environment. But if there are yeah. Israelis that come to them who say, you know, we're concerned about you, we care about you, and we're worried that this ideology is changing your community in ways that are not good for the relationship in the long run. I think that that's going to have some effect, but largely it's not in Israeli hands or in Norwegian sure. hands. <laughs> it's in um, it's in American hands, yeah. and uh, and and as much as possible, I would you know stay out of the public morass. You know, I I would caution Israeli officials to understand what the ideological terms are, and um, and to avoid stumbling on them you know don't don't look don't put yourself in the position of looking like the oppressor as much as possible you know because it'll only ma make matters worse um you know yeah. if it, it's no people are no longer looking at it with the same filter as before in may 2021 during the gaza conflict between israel and hamas it was just mm. a completely different ball game here as we like to say it didn't mm. it didn't feel like previous instances of conflict it's never been easy during those conflicts, it usually, but usually in America, the mainstream press would support Israel for the first few days until the casualties start to come, as they inevitably do, and then mm. they would turn on Israel and they would start reporting and uh, that there were problems, and is, they would demand that Israel immediately cut and run 
Um, that did not happen in May of 2021. It was there was an immediate revulsion of any of the imbalance and power that you could just feel from both the mainstream media and social media. So I think in, the, in that environment, Israel's just got to you know ask itself, you know, how does it want to present itself to a country like the United States that um, that you know is on 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 this ideological trend line. Yep. And um, and so I think that's what I'm I'd, I'd I'd be concerned with as well. Yeah. And but if the trend line continues, do you think that um, the Siri, who which party will be seriously harmed the first the relation to Israel or the Jewish community in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I think Israel's first. It's easier mm. to condemn Israel. It's easier to treat Israel as a proxy for Jews than it is to actually target Jews themselves. So mm. I think that um, I think the relationship with Israel is is more vulnerable in the immediate term than the American Jewish community is. But it doesn't take long for political forces to organize themselves and array themselves in ways that could easily target the American Jews. And it won't be all American Jews. It'll be the idea of American Jewish power in politics. Yep. The idea that we're engaging in some kind of illegitimate expression of our of Zionism by influencing the way some members of Congress vote or by, uh, by raising money in politics, like uh, Ilan Omar said, all the Benjamins you know, referring to yeah. twenty dollar bills. You know, I think that's that will gain ground over the long term, and it'll mm. it'll it'll happen. Um, American Jews, just like they were at Berkeley, will be excluded from coalitions on the left from coalition politics, and we've seen that in many places already. But that could become more commonplace over time, where yeah. American Jews feel like they're disenfranchised in a fundamental sense. I think the progressive left is working overtime prevent its own exclusion from um, Jewish progressive left, is working overtime to prevent its own exclusion from the, the larger progressive left. And they're taking steps to make sure that they're included. Some of that is by distancing themselves from Israel, which is happening in greater frequency. And some of it is like by you know, going in overdrive and in, in, in buying into woke ideology, no matter how crazy it gets. They're uh, they're there to let them know that they support it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else um, important in your book that you want to share with the uh, Scandinavian uh, viewers? Yeah. The only other thing I would add is I had a chapter on the assault on Jewish pride, mm. and I think that that's a, a key element of this. This not only imperils American Jewish standing in America. It also imperils our own identity um, yep. as um, a not wealthy uh, Israeli thinker and former Knesset member says it's it's like paying your pound of flesh, you mm -hmm. know, you, and um, it demands that you um, that you give up some key aspect of your identity in order to fit in. And I think yep. that's really, truly tragic. We've seen yep. Jewish institutions and Jewish schools teaching this ideology and teaching kids that they've been complicit in white supremacy, that they've taken advantage of their whiteness. And I, I think that's the, I mean, besides being untrue and outrageous, I think that's a terrible way of imparting Jewish pride to a younger generation. This community, yeah. the Jewish community in America has by and large stood in every single social justice challenge of our time. I, I, I think we, we vote in a way that's directly at odds with our own interests and and yet they're imparting um, this idea that we've somehow you know been complicit. I, and so I I'm, I think that's absolutely wrong. And I think yeah. that um, a good reason to stand against this ideology is it's terrible for Jewish life internally as well as externally. Yeah. And I mean uh, I think I recognize what what you are describing uh, as a new. Uh, tendency in the US. I think in Europe many Jewish leaders have for a long time um, bought their ticket to, 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 the, to the public space by, by criticizing Israel more, more than, uh, 
more than they really want to. It's like like they they um, they pay with uh, injuring injuring their own uh, identity somehow, and that's yes. really tragic. Quite tragic. Yep. And yep. so maybe we are a little bit behind you or ahead in that way or ahead of you, um, but we are. Yeah. Um, but it is it is catching up here too. Yeah. Uh, David, thanks a lot for joining us, and Thank all the best me. with uh, the, your book. Hope many will read it. Yes, I hope to come at some point to uh, to Norway or Scandinavia and, and talk about it as well. So yeah, look forward to it. That's great. Okay, all the best. Bye bye.